are in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, if you would turn there with me, please. The book of 2 Corinthians is all about change, really. It's about a church that uh, was in trouble, a church that was not um, very loving, a church that was full of gifts, but not using them in the right way. Um, The gifts are given to us by the Lord. When we get into heaven, we're not going to need those gifts. They're given to us here on earth to be able to make this life more pleasant. And uh, if they're used correctly, they end up being a blessing not only to us but to other people. But if they're not motivated out of love, they can be very destructive. So that's what this, in a nutshell, has been about Now, in our last study, we talked about the need for consistency and the need for separation. Now, please know and understand that I didn't just pick these randomly and then build a topical message out of them. We've been going verse by verse through the Bible, and we have gotten to this section, and Paul is dealing with the need for consistency and the need for separation. Now, consistency just means putting the time in to be consistent. A lot of times Christians are very, very inconsistent. In fact, I've noticed that there's kind of a tendency for people to be a bit inconsistent. In other words, they have a tendency to think through, and some some not even thinking through the first step. But sometimes we manage to think through the first step, but we don't manage to think through the second step or the third step, or the fourth step, or the fifth step, or the sixth step. And what I mean by that is a lot of times people make a decision based on what it feels like now. You know, I want to do this because I want to do it, or this feels good to do right now, or this seems like the right thing to do right now. But wisdom would dictate that we take that a couple steps further, sometimes even to to the next generation. And that is, if what I do now affects and hurts my children, then I need to be careful about what I do. If what I do now affects my grandchildren, then I need to be careful about what I do. In other words, there needs to be consistency. If our children or the people around us hear us talking all the time about cleaning up our language or trying to be consistent or being faithful, and then they turn around and they see us personally not being in certain areas, they're going to be the first ones to pick it out. And kids are going to see that, especially during their teenage years when they're wanting to go sin. And we're telling them they shouldn't be sinning, and then they're going to pick apart your life to see if there's anything in your life that doesn't match up. So as Christians, Paul is exhorting the church in Corinth, but I believe that he also is exhorting us, and that is to be consistent. Think it through. Think about the policy that you set for your life. You know, there's nothing, in my, in my opinion, and, and this, is, this is difficult because we all make mistakes, but one of the things that just really disappoints you is when someone says they're a Christian, and then the next word out of their mouth is a foul word. Now, I know that may seem insignificant to some, but those who are watching, they're looking for something that will clean up their mouth. They're looking for something that will clean up their life. They're looking for something that will teach them how to be a father, how to be a dad, how to be a a sister, how to be a, a productive citizen of society. They're looking for a way to get over their addictions, not to add more addictions into their life. So that call for consistency, even though it wasn't quite there in the church in Corinth, it became part of their life. Remember I told you that there was, there's actually three letters to the Corinthians, but the second one's been lost. So what we know as 2 Corinthians is really the third letter. So they changed. During the process of all this, they ended up changing. In our last study, we also talked about separation. Now, separation is a tricky thing because if we, comp- if we completely come out of the world, there's no witness. But balancing what he means by separation is vitally important. And by that, I think it means, from from my years of study, and that is be in the world but not a part of the world. In other words, you need to be in the world to be a light. People you work with, 
If you're in construction, you've got lots of opportunity to be able to not swear <laughs> because most of the guys around you are. Some of us have worked in really rough conditions. And believe it or not, you standing firm on your convictions makes a difference in the people around you. They notice that you're not doing what they're doing. So that separation, come out from among them and be separate. That means that as Christians, when, and I know this is going to sound funny to some of you because the current methodology, if you will, the current trend in Christianity is to look like the world. It really is. It's to blend into the world, to look like the world, to sing like the world, to to do whatever the world does. But I really believe that that's a dangerous place. And the reason I believe it's a dangerous place is because Scripture tells us that it is. We're supposed to be separate. Now, how are people supposed to know that we're Christians? Well, one of them for sure is by our love for one another, right? We know that. But there should be something noticeably in us that's different than other people. If we're doing exactly the same thing other people are doing, we are really not standing up for our faith. And let me toss this one in for you, since some of you, well, quite a few of you are younger than me, and that is that what's going to end up happening is you're going to find yourself very, very unhappy. You're going to find yourself very, very unhappy. You're going to turn around at 20. You're going to turn around at 23, 24, 25. And all these things that people kind of guided you into because they told you it was going to be a lot of fun, it's, you're, going to, you're going to wake up one day and you go, this is not fun at all. This is not fun at all. I'm, I'm lonely. I'm empty. I have a hard time finding anybody who just appreciates me for who I am, for whatever value I can contribute. You're going to end up in that place. That's, that's, where that, that's where Satan, that's where he wants every single one of us. He wants us miserable and he wants us alone. But he's smart enough to not tell you that that's the goal when he first begins. And he will put somebody cute, somebody good looking, somebody uh, popular, somebody that thinks you're awesome for a while. And he'll use those methods. You know, he's not going to put somebody ugly in your life because you wouldn't want anything to do with them, right? He's going to put somebody that to you is attractive. And that's going to slowly but surely weaken us. So, there in the last chapter, we learn that there needs to be consistency in our walk, and there needs to be separation. There are lots and lots of folks that need to be saved, and they need to see Jesus in us. Now, I know that sounds kind of crazy, but they need to see the Lord in us. They need to see that there is a difference in the way we handle things. And I'll tell you what, I think the greatest witness for the Christian is not when everything's going well. We can all do that, can't we? When everything's going well, can't we all be the model citizen? But how about when you suffer? You know, when things are not going so well. I believe that that's where you really find out what we're made of. And I'll tell you what, it's a little scary, isn't it? Because we've all been at the place where we've been tested almost beyond our, our abilities. And it's almost a little scary when we get to that, to that place. But I can tell you this. A Christian on a bad day is better than a person that's not saved on a good day. Because of Jesus Christ that is inside of them. So, revival... We talk about revival. The church needs to have revival, and I couldn't agree more. But oftentimes we expect it to happen with our wife first or our husband first, right? They need to get their act together, and if they get their act together, then I'll get my act together. Or we're waiting for the person in the row next to us or the one behind us and the one in front of us. If uh, we, we want revival to come, but we're not willing to let it happen to us. You see, there's such a difference between Hearing and hearing. We've got our two grandsons with us this morning. And uh, they're just at that age where they have lost all of their hearing. (laughs) I'm, 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 I'm dead serious. I mean, you can actually call their name. The other day we were in and out and Becky saying, boys, 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 boys. She must have said boys four times. She says, girls. And they all went. They heard that one. So you see, it's not that they can't hear, but it's selective hearing. 
You know, you, you have to say it four or five times. Now, what's my point? My point is, the Word of God is always speaking to us, but many, many times we're, we're like the two grandsons. We, uh, we're preoccupied, and the Lord has to call our name five, six, seven times before we actually listen. God is wanting to change us as individuals. Now, you might say, well, God hasn't called me to be a pastor. God hasn't called me to do this. No, but God has called you to be the best you that you can possibly be. He created you. He knows how you're wired. He knows exactly what you need. And he wants you to be what he created, to to be the maximum potential of what he created. And the enemy hates that. He'll knock you down at every corner. He will try to destroy you at every corner. But here's the thing. If you and I are going to change, there has to be an honest appraisal, right? If we're going to change anything in our life, don't we have to have an honest appraisal of our life? If we don't believe that we're an alcoholic, we're not going to change it. If we don't believe that our addiction is really an addiction, we're not going to change it. If we don't believe our spouse when they say, you're mean and ugly... Now, I don't mean ugly, ugly, but just your meanness is ugly, right? If we don't believe it, what are we going to do? Oh, yeah, well, your mama's mean and ugly. (laughs) Right? We're going to reject it. We're going to reject it. We're not going to accept it, and we're going to project it onto somebody else or to something else. And that's a lot of times what happens in a marriage. Instead of us listening, we project. Oh, yeah, well, you got this and you got that. But at some point in life, if we really want to change, and I know that there are folks sitting here this morning that we want to change. We want to be better. But if we're going to change, if revival is going to take place in our heart, we have to do an honest appraisal. And that's what we're going to see in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 in the first few verses. So pray with me. Father, we come before you this morning in Jesus' name. And we, we ask that we would hear but here with our hearts. And Lord, help us, to, help us to just be more humble in our life. Help us to realize that we don't have all the answers, that we're n- not always right. And uh, when it comes to spiritual things, we need to hear. We need to do an honest appraisal of our life. And then, Father, once we have that honest appraisal, we need to pray that you would give us the strength to face it, rather than to just not deal with it, but to face it and to deal with those things, and to ask you to give us the strength to make the changes that we need to make. So, Father, may you anoint your, we know your word is anointed, but may you anoint our ears and our hearts to hear what you would say to the church in Corinth, but you would also say to us and to the church that's in our heart and to the church that is represented here this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, look at verses 1 through 8. He goes, therefore, and again, you guys, the therefore is based on what he's already told us about coming out and being separate and being uh, consistent. He says, therefore, having these, be- these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a a really difficult task. Doesn't doesn't that sound like a difficult task? I could almost almost say maybe I could do this if he didn't have the word, word all in there. If he had just said, you know, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves of some of the filthiness and the flesh and the spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God. I could almost say, amen. But when he says all, I look at myself and I go, I don't know if I can do that. In all honesty, in all honesty, I don't know if I can do that. You know what? You can't. None of us can. Not without Jesus. Not without the Lord. That's why his presence is so vital in our life. Because we can't do this without the Lord. We're too frail. We're too weak. We're too human to be able to do that. Okay, look at verse 2. He says, open your hearts to us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have cheated no one. 
I do not say this to condemn, for I have said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts. Inside were fears. Nevertheless, God. I want you to underline that if you're writing your Bibles. Nevertheless, God. Not nevertheless, me. And not necessarily nevertheless, we. Nevertheless, God cannot separate him from our life if we want to walk this walk with victory. Nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, he comforted us by the coming of Titus. Now, I know in just saying hi to some of you this morning, you're a bit downcast. We've all been there, haven't we? To say that as Christians, we're not downcast from time to time, I think that would be false. There are times when we're downcast. But when we're downcast, the enemy tries to get us to find our comfort in other places other than God. Other than God's word. Other than the promises. Other than the Bible. Other than Christian fellowship. When you and I are downcast, often the last place we want to go is church. But you know where is the first place we need to be? in church, around God's people, in the presence of the Lord, being reminded like we are doing right now that God has the answers. Nobody else has them. The enemy's trying to pull us away with all of those other things that we are downcast from. But the, but, but the Lord is trying to say, I'm, I'm the answer. I've always been the answer. You're going to find your peace and you're going to find your comfort in me. Nevertheless, God, who comforts, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was comforted in you. They had also comforted Titus. And when he told us of your earnest desire, look at this, earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I don't regret it. Though I did regret it, for I perceived that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a little while. Now, as we've already studied, the church in Corinth was going, they were heading in a way that was not godly, and consequently it was not pleasing to the Lord. Look at, uh, I'm going to give you back at 1 Corinthians 3.3. 3. It says this. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to. It says, for you are still carnal. For where there is envy and strife and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Now let's make application to real life with this. If we have a lot of strife in our life, a lot of envy in our life, and divisions in our life, are we not carnal? Can't, can't we apply that same thing? If husbands and, fight, and, and wives are constantly fighting and, and dividing and there's strife over things, that's carnality. I mean, you, can slice, you, you have to slice it the way it is, right? That's being carnal. I am convinced that the reason for divorce is one simple little word, Sin. It's because one or the other or both are missing the mark. They're they're not, they just don't want to give up. They just don't want to give in. They just don't want to be the servant. You know, and I'm getting a little off track here, but being married is not what we think it is going in. As a Christian, being married is a greenhouse to learn how to lay down your life for somebody else. That's what it is. And once we get that picture, we realize we have a perfect marriage. Because we get lots of opportunity to lay down our life for the other person. But we have, and I don't know if it's from too many little romance nozzles, not nozzles, romance (laughs) nozzles. I don't know if it's from too many romance novels or what it is, but... You know, so I see even with my, my, with my granddaughters, they, they've, got this, they've got this romanticized uh, version of what 
a husband is going to be, and boy, are they going to be disappointed. (laughs) Every time I'm with them, I try to knock that down just a little bit because I figure one day somebody's going to appreciate the fact that I did that. But they, but they just, I, and I don't know, maybe that's just a part of being a little girl. But there, there is no Prince Charming other than Jesus. Because you're going to wash his underwear. <laughs> I mean, isn't that, isn't that the reality of it all? And, and he's, he's going to make noises. <laughs> and he's going to smell from time to time. I mean, that's life. That's what it really is. But, you know, it's another little granddaughter. She's so stinking cute that that's all she hears. That's all she hears is that we love you. You're so cute. You're awesome. You're wonderful. And sooner or later, there's going to be a guy coming along and going, you're just a woman. No matter how many people have told you a million times that you are the most amazing person in the universe, you're just a girl. Just a gal. That honest appraisal, that carnality, that envy, that strife, that divisions, you know, if that's what our, our marriage is full of, if that's what our life is full of, if we find ourselves always just being the kind of person that's kind of like, you know, growling all the time, you know, it, you, nobody's going to come up next to you because you're going to bite their head off. That, that's just not right, guys. You can't just say, well, that's just me. Well, then you need to change. <laughs> right? You, you can't, you, we can't do that anymore. That envy, that strife, that divisions, that's carnality. And we need to listen to what the Lord is saying, and we need to change that. Sometimes it's just an issue of realizing you've slipped into that. And then making a decision. That's that honest appraisal of just saying, this is not good. I don't want to go this route. Now, this is exactly what the church did. They changed. By the end of this chapter, in verse 16, he says, Therefore I rejoice that I have confidence in you in what? Everything. So from the beginning of the letter, he's telling them the things they need to change and grow up on. By the end of the letter, he's telling them how proud he is of them for the things that they've done. Now, what brought about this change? Let me ask you this. If, if every husband in here took this serious and said, I need to let things go, every spouse, not just husbands, but wives, I need to let this go. I need to not be right all the time. I need to forgive. I need to learn how to say I'm sorry. And I need to remember I'm not the king of this house or the queen of this house. I'm here to serve the person that I love and my children. Now, I want you to stop and think about what kind of change that would make in our homes. It would make a drastic, drastic change in our homes. Paul was their shepherd, and he loved them enough to be honest with them about their walks. Now, I've got to ask the question, are you the kind of person? Now, I don't know if any of us like this. But are you the kind of person that can have someone come up and say something to you that's maybe not the best thing in the world that you want to hear, but you will take that and you will evaluate it and see if there's truth to it? And if there is, do your best to try to change it? Or are you the kind of an individual when someone comes up and they tell you that, you want to just smack them? See, here's the thing. Most of us, our first reaction is to want to just smack them. But if we do that, we will never change. We will never change. And if we have two, three people in our life, four people in our life, five people in our life, you get to where you're 20 or 25 or 30 in your life, there's been more than two or three people come up and tell you about certain things, and they're consistent. You're too brash, or you're too this, or you're too that, or you're... We end up having a lot of people tell us that over time, but why are we still 50 and that hasn't changed? Because we didn't really listen, did we? We really didn't desire to change. In fact, I'll go all the way back to your parents. 
when you were a kid and your parents correcting you over certain things and some of them were consistent. Again, back to grandchildren. Becky or I will say, you know, pick up stuff in your room. Pick up stuff in your room. Pick up stuff in your room. To finally you want to just sell them. (laughs) Give them to somebody else. No, I'm just kidding on that, guys. But you know what I mean. You know the frustration of what I'm talking about. And if, if we've been told that by our parents even way back when, and we still are 40 or 50, and we're still doing the exact same things, then we really are not being honest with our shortcomings, are we? There's, not, there's really not been an honest appraisal of our life. Everybody else is weird, but we're okay. Okay. Please know and understand that those messengers that God have, has sent to you throughout your life to tell you these things, it's not been pleasant for them either. This wasn't pleasant for Paul to have to tell them what he had to tell them. He knew that it was going to hurt them. We, are, we just saw that. And he said that even after he wrote the letter, he hurt inside. He almost regretted that he had written the letter, but he saw the result. He saw that they had read the letter, that they had changed and then he says, I'm glad I wrote the letter. So keep, keep in mind that especially when you're kids and you're at home, your parents love you. At least most parents do, right? They love you. They care about you. And someday, it may take you 40 years to realize it, but someday you'll realize they were probably your best friends. So if the people closest to you love you that much and they are willing to risk you being mad at them, those are really good friends. Those are really good friends. All right, let's go on down. Um, In verse 7, Paul mentions three things that was produced in their heart. After he had written the letter to them, three things had been produced in their heart. You guys might remember reading the word longing, There was a longing in their heart. That means an earnest desire. After Paul wrote the letter, they probably didn't like it at first, but they began to pray about it and think about it, and then they decided that they really, really, really did want God's best for their life, so they decided to do something about it. And that something was to correct that young man that was in sin, as well as many of their gifts being used without love. They listened. They had a longing, an earnest desire. So here's, here's a point I want to make. With all of these things and this multitude of words and all the stuff that I've said this morning, unless there's an earnest desire to change, we're going to walk out. We're going to be the same individual. He also mentioned their mourning. When, he, when they took a look at how much they had fallen short, it broke their hearts. And you know, we still need to have our hearts broken, guys. If you've been a Christian for five minutes or or 25 years, we still need to be tender enough that our hearts can be broken, that we can take a look at where we're at and where we really would like to be and, and still have a broken heart about that. We need to not get crusty. They also said that they had a zeal. He said, Paul said, they had a zeal for him. Now, I want to give you this, guys, and and I... I'd like you to write it down, but if you're under 25, 27, I'd really like you to remember this because I think it becomes even more important when you're younger. Nah, it's important all the way through, but it seems to have more impact when you're younger. In Proverbs 27, 6, it says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. What does that mean? I want you to think about that. When we're out smoking dope with our buddies, they're kissing all over us. Okay, not literally, but you know what I mean. Oh, man, you're a great guy. Can I borrow some of your dope? I'll pay you back. Right? We're, there, there's kisses all over the place. You're, you're, you get a bunch of drunks in a bar, and they're all telling each other what great guys they are. They're sitting in the bar complaining about their wives, right, who are home taking care of the kids, and then the guys that are all drunk in there are going, oh man, she's just bad news. You just need to get rid of her. You're just a good guy. You know, it's like the blind leading the blind. So the point is, when you and I are running around sinning, 
We're going to find lots of people who are telling us we're doing the right thing and tell us how good we are at our sins. But are those really a friend? When it comes right down to it, when it comes down to life and joy and peace and happiness, I guarantee you there'll come a time when those friends are not even around you. They're not, in most cases, please understand what I'm saying, in most cases, they are not concerned about your happiness. They are concerned about how you make them feel. You make them feel that sin is okay because you're doing it with them. They're not concerned about you. If they were concerned about you, they would point at you and say, go home. Go home. Don't do this. Misery loves company, it seems. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. If you have someone in your life, a mom, a dad, an aunt, an uncle, a grandfather, a grandmother, or just a good friend who will tell you in love where you're wrong, you're really a blessed individual. I know it doesn't feel that way. I know it doesn't feel that way, but you're really a blessed individual because that person loves you enough to tell you the truth and risk losing your friendship in order to tell you the truth. And like I said, one of these days you'll realize that that first group of people that God puts in your life for that ends up being your mom and dad. And we oftentimes times end up resenting it, but there comes a time hopefully in our life where we begin to realize that not everyone who comes to us and tells us we've got a problem is a bad guy. In some cases, they are divine messengers from God. God has sent them into our life to point us back to Him. Now, in uh, this conviction, God will often tell us Himself. In fact, I believe that that's God's first line of defense or offense, whichever one you want to call it. But I believe that, a lot of, that most of the time God will come to us and tell us. There'll be that sweet conviction of God's Holy Spirit. Maybe you're listening to a, a song and it, it's, just, it's just kind of out there and the Holy Spirit says, you know, you need to change channels. Or you're watching TV and uh, he says, you know, this, this, is not, this is not really what you should be doing. You may be at a place you may be at a place, at, a, at a, a, a club. We'll be nice and call it a club, okay? You may be at a club somewhere, and the Lord says, why do you have me here? He'll usually speak to us one-on-one, but if we don't listen, then he'll send messengers along to tell us also. Because you and I have the Holy Spirit. In John 14, 26, he says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you into remembrance of all things that I have said to you. You and I have this built-in moral compass. When you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives in your life, and it is a moral compass. It points us to Jesus. Now, if we're in the middle of the woods and we're lost, and we have a compass, it would be really stupid to throw that compass away, wouldn't it? Or to ignore the compass? You take out the compass, and you don't like what it says, so you chuck it, and you're on your own. Isn't that what we do as Christians sometimes? God, I don't like what you said, so... Or let's take it one step to the, to the positive. We look at it, we don't throw it away. That's positive. That's good. But we don't like the way it's pointing. It's saying that north is this way, and we're absolutely sure that north is this way. So we fold it up, put it in their pocket, and we had this way. Right? We have the Holy Spirit that will show us what's right or wrong, but you and I can ignore him unless there's a sincere desire to change. Look at what the Lord said to the church in Ephesus. Look at Revelation 2, verse 2. You see, guys, once you have this honest appraisal, or we have this honest appraisal of where we're at, what comes next? What comes next? Well, look at the church in Ephesus from Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. 
He says, I know your works and I know your labor and I know your patience and that you can't bear those who are evil and you have tested those who say they are apostles and they're not and found them liars and you have persevered and have patience and you have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Now that's what most of us as Christians would say, right? If somebody came pointing a finger at us and saying we're not this or that, we might recite something like this. Well, yeah, but I go to church, I give, I tithe, I work in the Sunday school department, I do this and I do this. We might respond much of the same way. But look at what he says in verse 4. He goes, nevertheless, I have this thing against you. You've left your first love. Who is that? Who is that first love? Jesus, that's the Lord. He says, I have this thing against you. You've left your first love. And he says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Here's the word, guys, and it's that little dirty word we don't like to hear. Repent. (laughs) It's really a word. It's really there. I didn't make it up. I didn't write this. Repent and do your first works. What were your first works? When you first became a Christian, what were your first works? I don't know what to do. All I know is that Jesus loves me. I don't know which way to turn. All I know is Jesus loves me. I don't know about you guys, but when I first came to know the Lord, I had no clue other than the fact that I knew it was the first time I'd ever heard that God loved me. I'd heard that he he hated me. I'd heard that I was a sinner. I'd heard that I was going to hell. I already knew all those things. So when I heard those over and over again, that didn't bother me. But when I found out that there was a God who actually loved me in spite of myself, that blew me away. A father who would stay around, a father who would forgive, a father who would love, that just kind of blew me away. But you know what? In our first love, it was so pure. It was so innocent. And again, you, let's, let's go back to the two- or three-year-old. In, in a lot of cases, or the one-year-old, it's, it's a love of innocence. They'll come up and grab your leg or just give you a kiss or give you a hug, and it's not like, okay, I gave you a kiss, now how many tokens do I get? Or I just gave you a hug, let's go to the toy store. It's pure. It's just a, it's just a love. And when you and I first came to know the Lord, wasn't it kind of pure like that? Lord, I don't, know what, I don't know what the next step is, but all I know is that you love me and I, I want to love you back. So he's saying, remember from where you fall and repent and do your first works, trusting in the Lord with that childlike innocence, or else I will come quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. In 2 Corinthians 7, 9, he says, now I rejoice that you were made sorry, but that sorrow led to what? Repentance. You see, if you're just sorrowful, I haven't done my job. If all I succeed in doing is making you feel bad, I haven't really been a good pastor. But if I tell you, you know what, guys, you can get rid of all that guilt. And I tell you that God died for that so that you could have joy that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God, but that God has given us repentance, and that repentance leads to joy because it's a clean slate. Then I've done my job. The conviction of the Holy Spirit, does it bring about a godly repentance in our life, or does it just produce sorrow? In fact, that was the title of this morning's message. Is there repentance A resentment or a revival. You see, when we hear the word of God, we can just be resentful of what it says, and we can just say, uh, you know, you're just picking on me. You just don't want me to have any fun in life. Or we can hear it and say, you know what? I hear what you're saying, and I'm going to give Jesus Christ my life and my heart, and I'm going to repent of the things that I need to repent of, And that will turn around and bring you a joy. See, there's a difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. With worldly sorrow, there's no solution. There's no solution. 
In the world, when you do not have Jesus and do not have faith and someone that you love dies, what do you have? You have a funeral. And it's done. It's done. They don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe in God. So you've just, that person's gone forever in your life. As a Christian, you and I know it's graduation. Yes, we hurt. And yes, we hurt from the loss of it. But we also know that that there's going to be a rejoicing. We know that there's going to be a reuniting with that person because we know where they are. You see, there's, there's a, a worldly sorrow to a point, but godly sorrow produces something other than just being bummed out. You see, I think that godly sorrow is a good thing. Not all the time, but it's a good thing. If, I'm never, if I do everything in my life to push out every kind of sorrow, you know what? I'm going to be, I'm going to be a really obnoxious individual. If I don't ever want to hurt, and I successfully figure out how to do that, I'm going to be an obnoxious individual. Isn't it through pain that you learn things? Isn't it when you say something to someone and you break their heart that you begin to grieve, and when your heart breaks, you realize what a jerk you were to that person? And doesn't that make you think about it the next time before you just fly off the handle and say that? You see, that changes us. I don't know about you guys, but I, Lord, I don't know if I should even say this in front of the Lord, but I'm going to anyway. He already knows what's going on. I learn in pain. I grow in pain. I'm not necessarily asking for another load of it, but I'm, I, I, will, I grow in pain, guys. I don't grow when things are are great. Not like I do when I'm in pain. I pray different when I'm in pain. I think of other people when I'm in pain. I think of other people in pain when I'm in pain. My whole walk is different when I'm in pain. So God will use that. Godly sorrow. Look at 7 verses 10 and 11. It says, For godly sorrow produces what? Repentance leading to what? Salvation. Salvation. Saved. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner, what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves with indignation, with fear, with vehement desire, with zeal, with vindication. In all things you prove yourself to be clear in this matter. What is godly sorrow? What is godly sorrow? You know, I think that for me, the most hurtful thing and the thing that produces the most godly sorrow is when I know I've hurt the Lord. And you know what else? God loves his kids. If I hurt his kids, I've hurt the Lord. If I've stumbled even the littlest one if they've, if they've heard their pastor speak about repentance and speak about love and speak about joy and then they hear their pastor with a foul word, I've really, really, really scarred them. I've really hurt them. Same with my kids. Same with friends. We need each other to be strong. And we need to have that godly sorrow once in a while. I would like to say this. I've said this to two or three people over the last week, and I thought I would just include it with you guys. Here's one of the things that helps me, and that's to put a face on my enemy. When you think of Satan, what do you think of? Some vacuous, ghost-like, non-faced entity? Do you still think of him as a little guy in their little red suit with a pitchfork? 
told my grandsons this the other day because they play a lot of video games and I said, what is the absolute worst enemy and scariest enemy you have in all the video games you play? Now, I haven't, I, haven't gone, I haven't given them the answer to any of this yet. I wanted to let that set for a couple days. But here's the thing. Put a face on it. Put the most grotesque, evil, mean, vicious, wanting to slice you and your family to pieces face on this guy. Now, why do I say that? Because the next time you're fighting with your spouse... Remember, you're not fighting with flesh and blood. You're fighting with principalities and powers and wickedness. Evil. You're fighting evil. It's not really about that person. It's evil. When you're being tempted to do something you know that you shouldn't do, put a face on that. Now, let's take it one step further. If that face, that entity, that person knocked on your front door and said, Can I come in? What would you say? Sure, come on right in. The kids are in the bedroom. The wife's over there. Have at it. Have fun with them. Just do whatever you, you, you know. You know, what, you know what you would do? In the flash, you'd get out a gun and blow them up. Oh, sorry for the non-gun guys. But okay, let's let, no. Let's be honest here. Maybe you're not a you're not a, a, a gun person, but you would not let them come in and destroy your family, would you? I mean, you maybe you're a oh, kung fu guy or something, <laughs> you know. But you still, I, I find it hard to believe you would let them come into your home, right? right? You would do everything. You would be like over my dead body. You may destroy me, but you're not getting to my family, no matter what it takes. So when I find myself in those settings, putting a face to it, there's just something inside of me that goes, there's no way you're getting in. There's no way you're getting in. It, it, It helps me to realize I'm fighting against something that's very real, very real. And he may want me to sin in increments to finally destroy my life in the end, but if I give him even an inch, he'll destroy my life. And yet, guys, and and again, I'll address this to the men, but it should be to all of us, and that's if anybody knocked on our door to want to destroy us or our family, we would fight them to the end. And yet, we allow Satan to do it all the time. Sometimes we open the door and let him in. We leave it unlocked, knowing he's going to come in. Sometimes we even invite him in. I think that by putting a face on it, it makes a lot of difference. Guys, I was going to go over the vehement desire and the fear and the indignation, but I'll say this. There needs to be that vindication. What does that mean? That actually means avenging a wrong. Right? It means to set things right. Isn't that what repentance is? It's one thing to know that we need to change. It's one thing to know what God's telling us, but it's it's another thing to just say, you know what, I need to set this right. And most of the time, it's just between us and the Lord, but sometimes it's our spouse. We've got to go back to them and say, I'm sorry. Sometimes we've got to go to our children or to our parents and say, I'm really sorry. And I'm going to do everything that's possible within me to change that thing. All right, I'm going to close this. Look at verse 12 through 16. Therefore, although I wrote to you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong, nor for the sake of him who suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you so that you would know how much we love you and care about you. Therefore, we have been comforted in your comfort, and we rejoice exceedingly more for the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. Must have been from the south. <laughs> For if, any, if in anything I have boasted to him about you, I am not ashamed. For as we spoke all things to you in truth, even so our boasting to Titus was found true. And his affections are greater for you as he remembers the obedience of you all. 
how with fear and trembling you received him. Therefore, I rejoice, and I have confidence in you in everything. What a change. (laughs) What a change from the beginning of saying, man, you're letting sin exist in the church, and you need to correct this, and you need to correct this, to turn around and have the apostle Paul say that I rejoice, and I have confidence in you in everything. Now, are we sitting here going, well, that was, that was them, that I, I'm, not, I'm not capable of that? Yes, you are. In Christ, you are. God can change everything around in our life. I was talking to, again, my grandsons this, this week, and uh, they were talking about my, just my life, of, of how, because evidently their dad has talked about it, but how there was so much alcoholism in my family and uh, family of 11 kids growing up on welfare and then, you know, seeing the end result of what God does and, and I kept trying to tell them, but that's Jesus. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. And I know that's hard for a little 10-year-old or 12-year-old to understand, but that's Jesus. <laughs> that's the kind of God that we serve. You know, some of us need to break the chains of sin that our families created maybe generations ago. And I'm not talking about generational curses. I'm talking about us breaking that chain and saying, as for me and my house, I want to be a different individual. I don't don't want to always remain the same person, but I want to change. 